cost chain communications impossibility or possible compatibility with incentives by Alexei Zamyatin from the Imperial College of London and interlay.io. Um, take it away, Alexei. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, I am Alexei, I'm a PhD student at the Imperial College of London and recently co-founded Interlay. And today I'll talk about cross-chain communication and emphasize that it's impossible without a trusted third party and then discuss how we can get around with, around like this um, impossibility result using its um, incentives. So the motivation behind this talk and this, the field of research is quite straightforward. There exist over 5,000 cryptocurrencies which different design and purpose and we want, what we want to achieve is secure communication across different systems because it's quite fair, uh, it's quite safe to assume that there shall not be one chain to rule them all, given all the different features, designs, and communities in this field. Now, I think we can all agree to, to some extent, the history of theft and loss that we've seen with Bitcoin, with cryptocurrencies, is to some extent linked to centralized providers. Now, recently, so-called decentralized exchanges emerged. And while this is a very great idea, decentralized exchanges today are not really decentralized, but they're rather not custodial. But more importantly, they only operate on Ethereum using ERC-20 tokens for in the majority of cases, which means that they're not cross-chain. And this potentially can explain why they're still um, so far behind centralized exchanges with regards to trading volume. And this is essentially where Intellect comes in. Um, and this is basically also the field of research and work that we focus on. And our goal is to allow any user to use any asset on, on any blockchain platform. So you can use Bitcoin on Ethereum, Zcash on Polkadot, Litecoin on Cosmos, and so on and so on. Now, we've started off in academia doing research over the past three to five years um, and publishing top two academic papers. So Xclaim, which is a protocol that we're now building, um, was published at IEEE SMP, which is a top two security conference. And my co-founder, Dominic, released a paper um, building on top of Xclaim and other DeFi protocols um, at CCS. And recently, we received a grant from the Web3 Foundation to bring Bitcoin to Polkadot in a trust-minimized manner. So essentially, this is kind of one of our current projects where we're implementing Xclaim using Rust on Polkadot. Now, obviously, we're not only going to build bridges, but one of our additional goals and also to foster the ecosystem is to introduce um, cross-chain DeFi products. So essentially, we want to offer um, Bitcoin on decentralized exchanges allow users to lend Bitcoin to other participants, do margin trading, and so on, by bringing Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies that do not support these features natively or without a centralized exchange to platforms which support smart contracts or execution environments, which can allow us to build more complex applications. Now, enough of Interlay and the company business, let's talk research. So in this talk, I'll discuss the cross-chain communication problem, present the impossibility result, and then talk about Xclaim and how Xclaim fits into this whole picture. Now, th this talk is based on two papers. On one hand, Xclaim, um, which was released in 2018 and then published in 2019, and a more recent paper, um, a systematization of knowledge, basically a survey paper of cross-chain communication, which was released on ePrint, uh, I think, half a year ago. So, when talking about cross-chain communication, we can basically relate this problem to something way older than blockchain, and specifically um, communication across distributed databases. The main difference, however, specifically to the problem of non-blocking atomic commits, is that in blockchains, we assume that participants may misbehave. In distributed databases, you typically have an admin or a set of admins who you trust, and your only concern is that one of your databases may crash and that you may lose data, and hence, you must ensure that all transactions are atomically broadcast. In distributed ledgers, we have another problem. Not only can nodes not crash, but now they also can try to misbehave and send us invalid data or try to um, prevent data from being received by the participants. So we have to account for bits and teams failures when communicating across two blockchains. Now, talking about the main scenarios of cross-chain communication, I think the most famous one and the one that people are familiar with is cross-ledger transfers and exchanges. Specifically, atomic swaps have been around since 2012, I believe, and the idea is that you exchange assets across different blockchains. 
Uh, the alternative is cryptocurrency backed assets, which I'll talk about a bit later. Here, instead of exchanging assets, you move one asset from one system to another and basically then propagate all updates back to the original system once you're finished. A less known application for cross-chain communication is synchronization in sharded systems. In sharding, you separate a system or blockchain into multiple subdomains, each of which is typically responsible for some application set. Now, the problem is that if you do not, if you are not able to communicate across these shards, users using different applications will again have to download more and more data because they have to follow each shard to be able to um, use these applications. Obviously, it's much easier if you're able to move your assets from one system to another or make cross shard calls to the other contracts. However, the first use of cross chain communication was actually. From a, came from a completely different field. Specifically, merged mining it, um, is a way to reuse proof of work solutions to mine more than one blockchain in parallel without using additional proof of work. And essentially, what happens, and this is, was the case for Bitcoin and Namecoin, um, Namecoin accepted Bitcoin's proof of work. If you were to include some additional information in the Bitcoin block header and then broadcast it to the Namecoin network, um, the name code participants would actually be able to check that sufficient proof of work has been done and it would then generate the name code block. And finally, the term sidechains has been around for ages by now, and it's typically used as an umbrella term for the entire field of cross-chain communication. However, what we, what we try to position this terminology is in the field of, or in the use case of a feature extension. So you have one main blockchain like Bitcoin, and then you have sidechains, which are on one hand, independent blockchain systems, but to some extent dependent on the parent chain Bitcoin. For example, they use the same base currency or the security model depends on that of Bitcoin. And then these systems are typically used to provide new features to Bitcoin. For example, you have the liquid sidechain, which is a permission setup um, and allows companies to use Bitcoin in their uh, enterprise software. Now, talking about the cross-chain communication problem, um, we typically have two blockchains to distributed ledgers. This works for more blockchains in parallel as well, but we start with a simple use case. Now, blockchains typically have consensus committees. Um, in the case of Bitcoin and Ethereum, we know that proof of work, it's not really a committee, but you select a single leader once per round from a dynamic set of participants. However, we can abstract this and say that we have two consensus committees, one for Bitcoin, one for Ethereum. Now, let's assume we have two parties. We have Alice, who is on Bitcoin, and Bob, who is on Ethereum. We have two transactions. Transaction TX1 is owned by Alice. So she's the only one who can actually broadcast this transaction to Bitcoin because only she can sign this transaction and make it valid. Same goes for transaction two, which is owned by Bob. Um, Bob only Bob can broadcast this transaction to Ethereum. Now, transaction TX1, as mentioned, is a Bitcoin transaction. TX2 is an Ethereum transaction. Now, the cross-chain communication problem states that Alice, for, for some reason, knows about transaction TX2 and wants Bob to write this transaction to Ethereum. So Alice knows exactly that the transaction TX2 is valid on Ethereum, and she exactly knows how it looks like. And vice versa, Bob wants Alice to write transaction TX1 to Bitcoin. So again, he knows that, how the transaction looks like, and he knows that it is valid. And the goal that we want to achieve is actually to synchronize this process. So we want to ensure that both transaction TX1 and TX2 are written by both parties to the blockchains atomically. Now, this sounds very abstract. So what we can think of is that this is an exchange. Specifically, TX1 will transfer BTC to Bob's Bitcoin address, and TX2 will transfer ETH to Alice's Ethereum account. And now what we're trying to achieve is actually an atomic exchange, which is basically one of the steps towards the impossibility result I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Now, during my PhD, I, my goal was actually to find a way to communicate across different blockchains without using a centralized third party. And um, unfortunately, we recently realized that it is not possible. And I'll try to explain why this is the case. Now, coming from academia, we like to give or they like to define properties. So let's start by defining three properties for cross-chain communication, which are then relevant for our possibility result. First one being effectiveness states that if everything goes as planned, that means Alice and Bob are honest, they want to proceed with this communication or in our case, the exchange, and the two transactions are exactly as the parties expect them, 
then um, the exchange can proceed and we will end up with transaction TX1 being in Bitcoin and transaction TX2 being in Ethereum. Otherwise, if these transactions are not as we expect them to be, we abort. We now then introduce atomicity, which restricts the, uh, the possible outcomes such that neither Alice nor Bob can be left at a disadvantage. This means that either TX1 and TX2 are included in the respective blockchains or none of them are. So there is no case where Alice transfers Bitcoin to Bob, but Bob does not transfer ETH to Alice. And finally, allow this property timeliness, which we need to basically initiate the exchange. So if Alice and Bob are honest, they will eventually write their transactions to the underlying blockchains. So back to practice, as we discussed previously, um, Oops. Okay, so as we discussed previously, um, cross-chain communication can be presented as a fair exchange of assets between Alice and Bob. Because in our case, if we execute the, uh, the cross-chain communication, so we make sure that transaction TX1 and TX2 are included in both blockchains, Alice and Bob will have securely and atomically exchanged Bitcoin against Ethereum. Now, the thing is that fair exchange is known to be impossible without a trusted third party. In fact, this is a very old problem and a very old result. There's a specific paper dedicated to this from 1999, but this result was mentioned even earlier. And what we do in academia and on our paper, we reduce cross-chain communication to fair exchange. That means we show that the cross-chain communication problem is as hard as fair exchange. So if you come up with a secure cross-chain communication protocol, which does not use a third party, you will have solved fair exchange and you would then have solved consensus because fair exchange reduces the consensus. I will not go into the formal details of this right now, but if you're interested in how this reduction looks like, please have a look at the paper. Um, but what I will try to do is give an intuition of why this is the case using a few examples. Now, let's make our model a bit stronger than previously. Let's assume we have a smart contract on Ethereum, which can enforce correct behavior by Bob. Specifically, um, Bob locks transaction TX2 or his coins in the smart contract and states that if Alice sends Bitcoin to Bob, the smart contract will, re will release Ether to Alice using transaction TX2. That means once Bob has committed, he can no longer misbehave, he can no longer abort. So the only thing Alice has to do now is send Bitcoin to Bob's Bitcoin address and prove this to the Ethereum smart contract. And this is exactly where the possibility result comes in. Because the question is, how can we guarantee that after Alice has sent Bitcoin to Bob, that she actually proves this information to the smart contract? How does the smart contract or the consensus participants on Ethereum in this case become aware of this of the situation and then execute the and finalize the protocol? So we can or so we can or must assume two or one of the two following things. Either we assume that Alice is online and it means we, she's available. And we have a synchronous network. That means when Alice sends a message containing the proof to the smart contract, we know that this message will be delivered within a known bounded delay. That means, for example, we know that this message will, will um, be accepted by the smart contract within, let's say, five minutes, 10 minutes, or an hour. Alternatively, we can assume that there's a trusted third party. That means an honest online participant that will make this um, action for Alice. So he will take the proof and submit it to the smart contract, which will then execute and finalize the exchange. Interestingly, these two things are equivalent. And we can think of it as follows. In a synchronous model where Alice is online and she is still obviously honest to herself, right? Be so because it's in her own interest to submit the proof to receive Ether on the Ethereum side after she sent Bitcoin to Bob. So what happens is that Alice is her own trusted third party. And this is basically what the result states. So either you have synchronous assumptions and you're always online, and this is, for example, the case in HGLCs, or you have a trusted third party which will take this role and execute the exchange for you. So the main problem of cross-chain communication is actually selecting the right trusted third party or the right online honest party, because the word trusted is obviously um, can mean different things, can also mean financially trustless, which we'll talk about in a minute. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to select the optimal honest online party for your use case. And this can be Alice and Bob themselves. So you assume that both participants are online or you trust the consensus committees of Bitcoin or Ethereum. 
you can also employ an external committee, an external third party, like an exchange or a set of content or a committee, basically. Or you can basically merge these two approaches and have a watchtower where you first assume that Alice and Bob are online and will try to execute the exchange themselves. But if one of them crashes, then the watchtower, the third party, comes in and takes the role of the crash participant. Now the question, or one question that we often get when discussing about the impossibility is, well, this cannot be true because we know that atomic stops are trustless. And what I'll try to do now is explain why this is actually not the case. So typically in the most well-known atomic swap scenario is one that uses so-called symmetric locks, specifically hash locks, as we typically see in the case of Bitcoin. How this works is that Alice and Bob both lock their coins in contracts which state that if a secret is released, then the, the counterparty can spend the coins from this, from this output or in, in the Ethereum case smart contract. So what happens is that Alice basically releases a secret on the Ethereum side when she spends Bob's coins. Bob sees the secret and can then also spend Alice's coins. As simple as that. Now, one problem that we have at the beginning is that we have to introduce time locks because we want to ensure that once Alice has locked her coins and Bob has locked the, his coins, um, there is no guarantee that the counterparty will actually come online and trigger the exchange. So we want to prevent the coins of Alice and Bob being locked up indefinitely if one of the parties crashes. Hence, we use time locks, which state that if a specific period of time passes and the exchange has not been triggered, then Alice and Bob can recover their coins. And this is where our problem comes in, because if Alice spends Bob's coins, so Bob's ether releases a secret, but Bob's messages are never delivered or significantly delayed so that we don't have a synchronous communication model. We don't know when the messages will be delivered. And these messages can be delivered after Alice's time lock expires on Bitcoin. What can happen is that Alice receives Bob's Ethereum coins but then she's able after the time lock on Bitcoin expires to recover her coins as well. So what happens is she stole from Bob. She has Bob's Ether and her own Bitcoin. And obviously Bob being off on, offline can also be the case that Alice launched an Alice service attack on Bob or Bob simply crashed and did not send his message on time. Hence you need some, you either you just need to assume that Bob's message will always be delivered. So he's online and we have a synchronous network or we have a third party that will take Bob's message and broadcast it to Bitcoin, or basically take Bob's secret, the secret that Bob needs, and transfer the Bitcoin to Bob, or base or execute the entire exchange for Alice and Bob in the first place. Now, what if we have smart contracts? In the previous scenario, which we discussed, Bob locked his coins in a smart contract, um, and obviously we can argue that smart contracts are way more potent than simply hash locks. But the problem remains the same. If Bob locks his coins in a smart contract and requires Alice to provide a proof that she sent him Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side within, let's say, an hour, in the best case scenario, Alice will send Bitcoin to Bob and then make, submit the proof to the contract, which will then release Ether to Alice. During this whole time, Bob can be offline, so Alice bears a risk in this scenario. And the problem is the following, just like with HLC swaps, if Alice is not online after she sends Bob to Bitcoin, so she crashes or suddenly is unable to broadcast messages to Ethereum, Bob can simply recover his Ether and steal from Alice because he received Alice's Bitcoin and was able, was able to recover his Ether. So again, either both parties are online and we have a synchronous communication model, or we need a third party to enforce that Bob either cannot recover his coins and waits until Alice comes online again, or that Bob returns his Bitcoin to Alice because the exchange actually should have been aborted. Now, having discussed that cross-chain communication is impossible, um, the next step in this presentation is to talk about Xclaim and how Xclaim circumvents this problem using incentives and tries to achieve, to achieve financially trustless interoperability. Now, before we dive into the XPEN protocol, let's quickly take a look at the two types of cross-chain communication protocols that we have in the wild. We previously, and in this talk, have been talking mostly about exchanges. That means um, we want to synchronize two parties exchanging assets on two blockchains. That, what happens is um, coins change hands on two independent blockchains, 
what we do is we synchronize this process. So we ensure that, as previously in the case of Alice and Bob, Alice and Bob execute the swap atomically. But nothing, as you can see in the picture, there is no information, actually no coins are being moved from one chip to the other. And this is the other family of crashing communication protocols, specifically their one-way transfers, where we take one object on one blockchain and then move it to another blockchain. So what we do is we create a representation of, in this case, coin X on blockchain Y. And this is exactly what Xclaim does. Specifically in Xclaim, we employ the concept of cryptocurrency-backed assets. And the idea is very simple. You create an on-chain asset that is one-to-one -one backed by an existing cryptocurrency. For example, we can create Bitcoin back tokens on Ethereum, and we shall use this as, a rest, as an example in the rest of this talk. So the process itself is, again, very straightforward. You lock your Bitcoin, you receive one-to-one -one backed assets on Ethereum. And you can use these Bitcoin backed assets in decentralized exchanges, in payment channels, you can, use, you can create more potent and more complex atomic swaps. You can use these Bitcoin back assets in stable coins and DeFi products and so on and so on. And then once you're done using the Bitcoin back assets, you destroy them and you receive your Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side. Now, the problem that we have if we want to make this work for Bitcoin and other blockchains that do not support smart contracts. So if we have Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, we have more options, but if you want to use uh, this with Bitcoin or Zcash or Litecoin, for example, and create assets on Ethereum for one of these cryptocurrencies, we need to solve the problem of conditional locks without smart contracts. Specifically, Bitcoin has no way of knowing what happened on Ethereum. But what we want to achieve is we want to unlock the locked Bitcoin only when the Bitcoin back tokens are destroyed. So the first intuition that we would have is, well, why don't we use hash time lock contracts where we, you know, create a secret, and then once the secret is revealed on Ethereum, we release the Bitcoins. The problem is that this is not possible because smart contracts cannot store secrets or cannot generate unpredictable random numbers for the fact, for the reason that smart contracts are by definition publicly verifiable. So as soon as you store a secret in a smart contract, everybody sees it. And that means you cannot make conditional releases on the Bitcoin side. A further problem is that with hash time lock contracts, you have to know who will be the recipient who will be the person who's going to spend from the hash time lock. In the case of cryptocurrency backed assets, we don't know the person who will be the one who redeems the Bitcoin backed tokens for Bitcoin, because I can send my Bitcoin backed tokens to 10 other people, and there is no way for, for the hash lock on Bitcoin to know upfront who will be the recipient on the Ethereum side. Hence, we need some sort of custodian to hold Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side. However, our goal is to make this custodian non-trusted and hence we use collateral. So specifically in the Xclaim system model, we have users who lock Bitcoin to issue Bitcoin backed assets. They use these assets on Ethereum, for example, and then they redeem the Bitcoin backed assets by destroying the tokens and receiving Bitcoin. And then we have an intermediary on the Bitcoin side called a vault. And vaults hold users Bitcoin and they ensure that once the Bitcoin backed tokens are destroyed, the users actually receive the correct amount of Bitcoin on the Bitcoin side. Now vaults are non-trusted and are collateralized. So a vault locks up collateral in Ethereum on the Ethereum side in a smart contract. And this collateral is used as a hedge or as a, as a security against misbehavior of the vault. So if the vault misbehaves and does not release a Bitcoin to the user, the user is reimbursed using the vault's collateral. Now the set of vaults in Xclaim is dynamic and permissionless. That means any person can at any point in time, join the system by locking up collateral and becoming an intermediary, which also means that I myself as a user can become an, a vault and an intermediary for myself. So I actually don't need a third party. I can be the third party myself. Now, this entire process is enforced by an on-chain smart contract on Ethereum, which handles the issuing, trading, and redeeming of the backed assets and enforces or incentivizes correct behavior vaults by slashing the collateral in case they misbehave and paying them fees if they behave correctly. Now, if we take a look at the Xclaim architecture, the process itself and the concept is quite simple. What is complex is actually getting this to work and building this in practice, because there's a lot of moving components which interact with each other. We need PTC relay, which I'll talk about in a minute, to be able to verify the state of Bitcoin, because we need to be able to check whether a specific transaction was included. Otherwise, we have no idea whether a user has sent Bitcoin to a vault. 
We also have an exchange with Oracle because, as mentioned before, the collateral is locked up in Ether. So we need to balance the exchange of Bitcoin against Ethereum. And then we have a treasury which manages the assets, uh, the Bitcoin -like tokens. We have a registry for vaults where people can join and leave the system at any time. We have a module that handles collateral and stabilizes collateral against exchange rate fluctuations. And then we have three main protocols. Issue to create Bitcoin back tokens, Redeep to destroy Bitcoin back tokens and get Bitcoin back. And we have an atomic swap protocol um, called Replace, which allows vaults to exchange um, collateral against Bitcoin. So essentially a vault can say that it wants to leave the system and be replaced by another user who, which locks uh, sufficient collateral for the vault to transfer the Bitcoin to the new vault. Now, let's talk about one of the main components and the most important components of, BTC, uh, of Xclaim, and that is BTC Relay. So chain relays are cross-chain SPV or light clients. And the idea is that just like a normal light client, you download the block headers, but not the entire blocks. So you only care about the transactions that are relevant to you. So essentially what we're doing is we're encoding the functionality of a light client into a smart contract on Ethereum. And the operation is again, pretty much straightforward. The PDC relay accepts Bitcoin block headers and tracks the Bitcoin main chain. It checks the difficulty adjustment and checks whether the block headers um, constitute a single long chain and it is able to detect forks. So if you have two different Bitcoin blockchains, it is able to check which of them is actually longer, which of them has more accumulated proof of work. And then what we can do is we can submit transactions and Merkle paths. So specifically, we open the vector commitments in the block headers to prove that a specific transaction was included in a Bitcoin block. Again, just like a light client. Now, let's talk about the extent protocols. So as mentioned, we want to issue Bitcoin back tokens on Ethereum. So as a first step, um, the vault, who can also be Alice in this case, that locks collateral in the Ethereum smart contract. Next, Alice sends Bitcoin to the vault and then submits a proof to the BTC relay component of our smart contract, showing that she indeed sent the Bitcoin to the vault as expected. And then the smart contract specifically BTC relay verifies that this transaction is indeed included in Bitcoin. And then the smart contract places Bitcoin back tokens to Alice. That's it, fairly simple. One problem that we have in this approach, in this naive setting, is that we have race conditions. Specifically, Alice obviously only wants to send Bitcoin to the vault if she, know that the, if she knows that there's sufficient collateral on the Ethereum side to ensure that if the vault misbehaves, she'll be reimbursed and hence suffer no financial damage. The problem is that we can have race conditions. Specifically, two users, Alice and Carol, can try to lock Bitcoin for the same amount of the vault's collateral. So you have Alice and Carol sending Bitcoin to the vault at the same time, but only one of them will have the Bitcoin backed by collateral, and the other person will basically have no security whatsoever. And the other problem is that the vault can try to withdraw the collateral before Alice can finalize the issue process. So specifically, Alice sends a Bitcoin to the vault, and before she's able to submit the proof, the vault withdraws the collateral, now having the collateral and Alice's Bitcoin. And this can happen due to latency, denial of service attacks, and just some delays in the network. So what we want to do is we want to, first of all, prevent the vault from withdrawing his collateral at any point in time, but you have to have a multi-step protocol where you announce that you want to get your collateral out, then we wait for pending issue requests to finalize, and then the vault is able to withdraw. And more importantly, we use so we use a two-phase commit protocol. So specifically, we create so-called collateralized issue commitments, where Alice first has to commit in the Ethereum smart contract that she is going to issue a specific amount of Bitcoin. So let's say one she wants to create a one Bitcoin back token, and then the contract locks the vault's collateral for a specific period of time. And now Alice has for let's say one hour to send the Bitcoin to the vault and then submit a proof to the contract. So that we, which basically prevents multiple users um, issuing at the same time for the same collateral and also prevents the vault trying to get the collateral out before Alice finalizes. Obviously, Alice could be malicious and try to keep locking the vault's collateral without ever actually locking and creating Bitcoin back tokens. So what we require Alice to do is provide some minimum amount of collateral on Ethereum, which will be slashed and given to the vault to cover opportunity costs if Alice commits to locking the vault's collateral, but never actually executes their issue protocol. 
Now, transferring, swapping, and using these Bitcoin Map tokens with applications is very simple. It's just like using an Ethereum native asset, like in any UC20 token. That's it. So it's very easy. And yeah, these tokens are fungible, and that's the whole point of it. Now, let's say Bob receives some Bitcoin Map tokens and wants to actually go back to Bitcoin and receive Bitcoin for that. So what Bob will do is Bob will lock or burn his Bitcoin Map tokens in the contract. The contract will emit an event signaling the vault that it must now come online and send uh, Bitcoin to Bob. The vault observes this event and then releases Bitcoin to Bob on the Bitcoin side. And now what the vault must do is submit a proof to the smart contract that it indeed behaved correctly. So the vault submits a proof for this transaction that basically released uh, Bitcoin to Bob. And only then, once this transaction is verified, can the vault take back its collateral. If the vault fails to do so on time, so the vault basically either stole the Bitcoin beforehand or did not adhere to the protocol, it did not release the Bitcoin to Bob, the vault will be slashed. In practice, what will happen is one of two things. Either Bob receives the collateral in Ether plus a premium. So what Bob actually received is a very good exchange of Ether versus Bitcoin, and then actually can go and buy Bitcoin using his Ether holdings and actually make a profit of the vault misbehaving. Or Bob decides that he wants to try the redeem process with another vault, and the vault that basically failed to execute the redeem is turned offline, and then we can either slash it or just banish it from the system for a specific period and prevent it from earning further fees. Now, one problem that we have in Xclaim, at this point at least, is that we have collateral locked up in a different currency than Bitcoin, which means that if the exchange rate of Bitcoin to Ether fluctuates significantly, we may have a problem that the collateral locked in the contract is worth less than the actual Bitcoin holdings of the vault. This only happens if the price of Bitcoin significantly increases compared to that of Ethereum. So if Ether crashes completely and Bitcoin increases quickly. Still, we need to mitigate this issue. And what we do is we have a multi-stage uh, collateral uh, uh, system where we over collateralize vaults. So for example, a vault must lock up twice as much Ether as it's going to accept in Bitcoin. And then if the exchange crashes, we have a setting where the um, vault is under, it's below the optimal collateral rate, so it can no longer accept new issue requests, but there's still sufficient collateral for secure operation, and the vault has no incentive of stealing the user's Bitcoin because it will lose money if it does so. If the exchange rate keeps falling down and the vault takes no action, so the vault does not try to make users redeem or does not increase the collateral rate, um, at some point, our protocol triggers an auction, vault auction. So specifically, we have a specific additional role called a keeper, which can be, again, any user or any vault, which basically comes in and puts a bid for the vault's collateral. So the user then locks speci a specific amount of collateral necessary to prevent the vault from failing completely, and then the vault is replaced. And the keepers receive a fee, basically, from the vault's collateral. So the vault is then penalized, but does not lose everything. If this does not happen, at some point, we have an automatic liquidation mechanism in place, which basically forces the vault to return the Bitcoin to the users. Uh, and this can be triggered either by the exchange rate oracle itself, which keeps submitting the exchange rate into the contract, or by any user or watchtower. And this can obviously be an opt-in, opt-out feature, because if users use um, Bitcoin Mac tokens applications, it may be not the best idea to liquidate it automatically without at least having the user acknowledge it. Now, what does Xclaim give us? So Xclaim, uh, from this whole list of properties, what is really interesting is that Xclaim ensures consistency. So assets are only created on Bitcoin if they actually have the uh, uh, equivalent amount of Bitcoin locked on the Bitcoin side. Furthermore, we guarantee that a user will always be able to redeem his Bitcoin back tokens. Either he, the user will get Bitcoin or he will be reimbursed in Ether. And finally, and this is a very important point, you do not need a third party to use Xclaim. Specifically, Xclaim is constructed in a way that while you still need a trusted third party to actually theoretically be able to achieve cross-chain communication, in our protocol, you can be a third party yourself. So you can choose between the different models. You can either say, okay, I'll be online. I don't want to trust anyone else. I take the risk of that if I crash, I may not be able to execute the protocol, but I don't need a, a third party. 
or you trust the user another vault and you have a, another third party, but it is collateralized. So yeah, I'll guess I'm running out of time. So I'll probably skip over the system requirements. But one important thing is that we don't need anything on the Bitcoin side. So on Bitcoin, we just have standard transactions. On the Ethereum side, we obviously have smart contracts. And the most important thing is that we need to be able to verify the set of Bitcoin. Um, now, yeah, yeah. You have another 15 minutes, so it's not a problem. Ah. Um, we okay. Just, uh, we uh, we can use you know some of it for Q and A, but um, it's up to you. Great. I think I'll need like another five minutes at most, and then ten minutes for Q and A. If that's okay. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Great. So we implemented Xclaim on Ethereum back in 2018. So we used the Solidity version that was live back then, and. Um, Basically, we have two parts of the contract. On one hand, we have the Xclaim smart contract, which handles the collateralization of vaults, the registration of vaults, and the issue and redeem processes. And we have a BTC relay component, which is able to verify the Bitcoin state on Ethereum. So um, back then, BTC relay actually was still live, but it was no longer used. So BTC relay itself, the first version of this was released in 2016. However, um, the version that was implemented in Serpent was deprecated um, and uh, it fell behind the Bitcoin blockchain. I think it was 90,000 blocks back then. So what we did is we started implementing a new version in Solidity and we tested this on the Robson network and this was mostly an academic prototype. What we're doing right now is on one hand we're revamping our efforts to implement Xclaim for production and what we're doing currently is also building Xclaim for Polkadot. So we have implemented the BTC serially component um, that allows you to verify the state of Bitcoin on Polkadot, and this is um, built using Rust and the Substrate Framework. And what we're currently doing is implementing the XCOM component itself, and we're planning to ship this in mid-May. So in mid-May, we'll have a POC for the entire system in Rust. Um, we did already estimate some costs back then from our Ethereum prototype, and what we saw, I mean, the gas costs and the exchange rates are a bit off by now, um, but this keeps changing. But Approximately, it costs around one to two dollars to issue an arbitrary amount of Bitcoin tokens on Ethereum, whereby the largest cost factor is obviously um, the Bitcoin side, where you have the higher fees. And similar for the time, it um, it does take a bit of time. So the issue and redeem processes are purposefully slow because you really want to make sure that you wait for the sufficient amount of confirmations on Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, but the benefit is that once you have executed the issue protocol, you no longer need to synchronize Bitcoin and Ethereum for each swap you make. So now you're actually swapping natively on the Ethereum blockchain and you don't need to care about the cross-chain aspect anymore. And you only care about synchronizing Bitcoin and Ethereum only when you execute the redeem protocol, which is quite important because if we compare Xclaim to HLC atomic swaps, we see that if we had execute a thousand swaps with using HLCs and compare that to issuing Bitcoin back tokens, executing a thousand subs and then redeeming them, Xclaim is in this case 95% faster and 65% cheaper than using HDLCs. And the main reason is that in HDLCs, when you're with hash locks, you need to set up the protocol each time you make a swap. So it's completely memoryless. So each time you want to exchange Bitcoin versus Ether, you have to communicate with your counterpart. You have to have an offline channel where you exchange the revocation transactions and to be able to be sure that you can actually recover your coin if something goes wrong. And then you have the whole process of revealing the secrets. So you need to synchronize the times between the two blockchains and so on and so on each time you make a swap. Whereas in Xclaim, the idea is that you only do this twice. Once when you create the tokens and once when you redeem them. In between, you don't have to care about the state of Bitcoin. You don't have to synchronize the two systems locally. That's it. So thanks a lot for listening. Summarizing, we show that cross-chain communication is impossible without a trusted third party. Um, however, we can use incentives to prevent theft and incentivize honest participation and achieve financially trustless cross-chain communication, for example, in Xclaim. And we're currently building Xclaim. So we're right now building, uh, bringing Bitcoin to Polkadot using this framework, and we're planning to extend this and build more bridges between Bitcoin and other systems and also other cryptocurrencies like Zcash and Litecoin and so on. If you're interested, um, please take a look at our papers. We have two papers which we published with Imperial College London. One is the Xclaim paper, which was accepted at the Top 2 conference. 
Then we have the uh, survey of cross-chain communication, which is a very good starting point if you want to find out more about how blockchain interoperability works. And then we have the full uh, specifications of how to actually implement XCOM in practice, which is a 200-page document and very, very detailed. And we also have a repository where we can check out our code, um, which is currently work in progress. Thanks a lot. And yeah, please ask questions if you have any. My, my first question is, I'm going to share my screen. How is, how, how is what you're doing different from what's happening with, uh, with liquid and liquidity? Um, and the simplicity language that, that, uh, that Blockstream is working on, uh, Adam back, um, and then Grubles and I think James Presswich, you know, had, had, uh, atomic swappability, uh, for Ethereum and Bitcoin, I guess maybe a year or two ago, I, I couldn't really find the, the thread talking about it, but there's, it's, there's been numerous implementations uh, of doing this, and, and of course, I'm sure that you're aware of them. Um, I'd like you to take the opportunity to explain what it, how it is, what it is that you're doing uh, is, is different. No? Sure. Um, so let's start with comparing Xclaim to uh, the Blockstream uh, sidechain. So the difference here is that um, Blockstream, the liquid sidechain is pegged to Bitcoin in the sense that since it's permissions, so you have a static set of community participants, you can use these participants on the Bitcoin side to be the ones who hold the user's Bitcoin. So the, what it happens is that the user has to anyway trust the committee um, of the liquid BFT protocol because it's a permission setup. So what happens is, and it's the best way to do it in this case is that you have the same committee be responsible for holding the user's assets on the Bitcoin side. The next claim, the setup is dynamic. Since Ethereum is the permissionless blockchain, we can actually make use of this and allow anyone to participate in the XM protocol. That means we don't have a predefined set of vaults. So whereas in Liquid, I know that I have to send my Bitcoin to the uh, multisig address or whatever um, is being used uh, the, that is basically controlled by the Liquid blockchain consensus participants, in X claim, this is not the case. I can just come along, lock collateral for myself, and send Bitcoin to my own Bitcoin address and just put this to Ethereum. And then I can send Bitcoin to other users, but then I have to stay online, obviously, and be the one who executes the routine protocol and then sends Bitcoin to the recipient of the Bitcoin back tokens. But the concept is that I don't, do not need to trust anyone in that sense. And any user can join the system at any time. So we don't say, okay, look, you have 10 possible vaults, 10 possible ways to issue Bitcoin back tokens. Um, what we do is we say, okay, look, anyone can register and then you choose one of the people or you become a vault yourself. So that's the subtle difference. Okay. Um, then let's, uh, let's talk about also, uh, let's, let's compare this, this collateralized, um, set up with what's happening with, with maker. How, how do you see the differentiation there as well? So obviously we have to over collateralize to be able to account for the change fluctuations. Um, the difference is right now in the base form of X claim, um, you don't really bet against the price, uh, when you issue, when you basically become a vault, what we're doing right now in this part of our project with Polkadot, um, what we're building is Bitcoin financial products, which will allow you actually to bet and earn interest on the Bitcoins that you're locking as a user and also earn interest on the collateral you're locking as a vault. But that's an additional feature on top of Xclaim. Xclaim itself is just the core protocol which moves assets from one chain to the other and uses the collateral to provide incentives and ensure that users don't lose funds. Obviously, you could reuse this collateral that is lying around anyway to allow people to use interest and to build a protocol on top of that. And that's part of the bridge. And that's one of the things that we're going to do. Cool. Um, well, yeah. I'd like you to talk a little bit about, about the Polkadot implementation, why it is that you've chosen Polkadot, uh, because we have this sort of tribalism as well in, in Ethereum. And uh, so it'd be nice to hear your perspective in working on, on this, why it is that you're choosing to use, use uh, Polkadot. So, First thing, I mean, we're not really choosing to only focus on Polkadot. Um, we're also continuing. <laughs> sure. Um, but our goal is to continue our implementation of Ethereum and also integrate with systems like Cosmos or even permission systems. Um, we're just a bridge. So we provide you with the opportunity to move Bitcoin to different platforms. 
And Polkadot um, was a great opportunity for us because, well, I mean, they're launching soon and it gives us the chance to actually integrate with a new system and have our Bitcoin bridge live the moment when mainnet comes in. And yeah. And then we received a uh, grant from the Replay Foundation. So we're focusing on Polkadot right now, but obviously we're also moving forward with Ethereum efforts. Uh, but then we're also kind of observing the situation and deciding how to best place our system. On the cool. Market. So do you see um, advantages or disadvantages with E2.0 and all the sharded chains? How, how do you, how do you look at, because, you know, we're, we're there with Polkadot. Um, how do you see that, that engineering uh, implementation uh, with e ETH 2.0? I mean, it's hard for me to say. I, there's so much happening, so I, I'm not quite sure how far it is currently. But I guess that the sharding approach is definitely interesting. And the fun thing is that you could actually use Ixlim in, in sharding as well. So it doesn't really have to be two independent blockchains. And in fact, there is sharding protocols which employ a similar technique as Ixclaim to move one asset from one shard to the other. And then the only question is, again, which third party do you choose? Do you choose the consensus committee of the target shard? Or do you say that your the consensus committee of your source shard submits a proof to the target shard? And then the users on the target shard verify. Or do you, again, have a dynamic approach? Again, this is a problem because as of today, sharding um, currently only works in a system where you have a predefined set of consensus participants per shard. So you can have an open system in theory, but you need to know upfront which set of committee use or consensus participants is allocated to each shard. So I guess so the, for now, yeah. the primary message is that I'm that I'm taking away from this is that you're insisting that we need a third party, which was you know the point that we thought we took away with Bitcoin. Um, but you're saying that you can apply the same principle of trustlessness. So what you so summarizing what you what, what you need is that you need some party to be online and this party has to behave correctly. I try to avoid the use the word trustless by now because trustless is often interpreted as financially trustless that you, users have a guarantee of not losing their funds. But this is not exactly the case. So what we so the result states you need an online party that is honest in the sense that it behaves as a protocol specifies. However, what you can do is you can use incentives and collateral to build a construct around this that ensures that even if the party misbehaves and actually the cross-chain communication fails, so your protocol failed, but what you can ensure is that users at least don't face financial damages. Yeah, that's basically the takeaway. Excellent work. Nice to meet thanks. you. Great, yeah, thanks for organizing this. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely, stay in touch. Great, definitely. Cool. Then, yeah, thanks a lot. And right, yeah, stick around for a bit.